So um, last week we kind of started a series and we kind of towed, uh, put our toe in the water with the idea of God with us, right? God with us. And God with us is something that we think about often around Christmas time, isn't it? We think about Emmanuel, which means, which is God with us. Some scripture that we think of uh, specifically every year around Christmas is this Isaiah seven fourteen, Matthew one twenty three uh, uh, references this, but it says, "Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a son. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son." and shall call his name Emmanuel. And that's the Matthew text adds and kind of clarifies, which means God with us. You need to understand something incredibly important. Before we go any further today, I want you to hear me. God is near. He's near. If you put your faith in Jesus, God is with you and he is in you. Amen? But from the beginning of creation until the end of time and beyond in eternity... God's heart is, I will be with my people, and my people will be with me. So this God with us is not an only a Christmas thing. We just think about it a lot at Christmas, and so we're going to talk about it over the next few weeks, uh, discussing and, and studying this. John 1.14 says it somewhat like this. When Jesus came, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This Luke 2, 11 says, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. We often think about this with Christmas, and it is a good thing, but if we aren't careful, we will accidentally turn this into just a Christmas thing, and we'll miss the big picture. And what we said last week was, is that Scripture is one big story. It's got lots of little stories in it, but it's really one big story, isn't it? And it's the story of God creating man, man sinning against God. And then the rest of the Old Testament is God showing us that we can't be good enough to, to save ourselves and to bridge that relationship back. So God planned to send his son as savior. And then the New Testament starts. Jesus shows up. He shows up in the flesh, 100% God, 100% man, and he shows up to be that propitiation, that substitute for us. And on the cross, listen, the reason we celebrate Christmas is because of Easter. You know that, right? The resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection is central to the gospel message. If there's no death, burial, and resurrection, there's no Christmas. Amen? Okay? And so it's one big story. Well, here's what happens. Jesus dies on the cross to take our punishment, to take our sin, past, present, future. Our sin, the sin from the Old Testament, which God overlooked. Any sin after that, after the cross, and anyone who looks to the cross and looks to the resurrection to Christ in faith will be saved. But we have this period of where we are now. We're kind of in this already but not yet kind of time where we, God is with us and in us. His Holy Spirit is in us, but we haven't fully embraced, we haven't fully experienced, I should say, the promise because there's a day coming. My dad this week, because he had put his faith in Jesus, he's with the Lord now. He's with the Lord now. And so if you don't get anything else I say today, here's what I want you to get. There's this window of time that you have in your life and if you put your faith in Christ, you will be saved. But if you don't, you'll get what you deserve. You don't want what you deserve. Amen? I don't want what I deserve. I can tell you that much. Right? So, so we're kind of in this now, but there's a day coming. There's a day coming where it's done. Jesus is coming back for his church. There's going to be this end time, and then after that, new heaven, new earth. He's going to make everything new. And if you want to understand a little bit even of what it's going to be like everything new, let's go back and let's look at the beginning. Because when he makes it new, it's going to be like it was in the beginning. All right, so let's look together. Genesis, we're going to look at part of Genesis chapter 1, a, a decent amount of chapter 2, and then one, like a half of a verse of chapter 3, Okay. So today's message, what we're, gonna, what we're calling today's message is how it started. Have you guys seen these, uh, these uh, 
these uh, memes, these tweets, these uh, Facebook uh, has kind of taken some of it now. It's the, people are posting these memes, it's like how it started and there's a picture and then like how it's going, right, or how it ended. Have you seen this stuff? How it started, how it, how it ended, how it started, how it's going. I've got a few for you. I want you to check this out. Here's one of them. Okay, this is kind of a relationship thing, how it started versus how it's going 10 years later. Isn't that sweet? That guy, he, uh, Tom did him some good, didn't it? He went from being shorter than her to being, he's, look, it's, this is good, okay? So how it started versus how it's going. Here's one relationship status that it went well, right? Well, here's another one. How it started versus how it's going, right? He turned into a Christmas tree, basically, is what happened there, and the dog got bigger, right? All right, here's another one. Here's us in 2020, how it started and how it's going. This is us, all right, some of us at least. Here's another one, how it started versus how it's going. Look, look he's, he's a young man. Hey, going, uh, you know, I'd like to have something to do with this airplane one day. I don't know, and now how it's going. I don't know if he's a pilot or if he's working, whatever. But look, how it started versus how it's going. Some career choices. Well, here's one that didn't go as well. How it started, <laughs> how it's going, right? It started better than it's going, right? Kind of the other end of that. And here's one more. Here's one more for fun. This is some of us at Thanksgiving or Christmas, right? If you're frying a turkey, this be careful, okay? Uh, how it started versus how it's going. God, be careful, buddy. All right? So, um, so, so often how it started, sometimes it starts well, sometimes it doesn't start well. Sometimes it, it's, it goes well, sometimes it go, doesn't go well. But what we do know, how it starts is an important part of the story. And spoiler alert, it ends well for the Christian, even if it's not going well right now. Okay? It ends well for the Christian, even if it's not going well right now. All right? So how it started. Let's look at a few things. How it started. Well, what's it? Well, this big story, this one big story. One big story. How did it start? Well, God, first, God created mankind to know and to love him. God created mankind to know and to love him, and to be loved and known by him as well. But let, let's start this here. Just God created man, okay? God created man. Uh, James Dobson wrote this, and then Chuck Swindoll uh, shared it. It's something called The Tale of the Tardy Ox Cart. He kind of talks about this. But a few years ago, uh, a psychologist, Ruth W. Berenda, and her associates carried out an interesting experiment with teenagers. It was designed to show how a person handled group pressure. You remember being young and just feel that, that desire to kind of fit in the group and to follow, even if you did, weren't sure that the group was right, right? And so they, they did the study, and the plan was simple. They brought groups of 10 adolescents into a room for a test. Uh, subsequently, each group of 10 was instructed to raise their hands when the teacher pointed to the longest line on three separate charts. So they got three charts up, and when the teacher pointed at it, they were supposed to raise their hand when the teacher was pointing at the longest line, all right? What one person in the group didn't know, though, was that they were the only one that wasn't in on it. Ten people are brought in. One person has no clue what's going on beforehand. The other nine do, and this is what they were told. We want you other nine to raise your hand at the line that's the second longest, Raise your hand for the line that's second longest. We're going to give the instructions, hey, raise your hand when the teacher points to the longest line. But you nine, raise your hand when, when she points or he points to the second longest line. Regardless of the instructions they heard, once they were all together in the group, the nine were not to vote for the longest but the second longest. So the psychologists were hoping to determine how one person reacted when completely surrounded by a large number of people who obviously stood against what was true. All right? The experiment began with nine uh, teenagers voting for the wrong line. The stooge would typically glance around, frown in confusion, and then slip his or her hand up with the group. Just over 75% of the group, of the one person who didn't know what was going on and all these groups they, they pulled through, over 75% of them that one person who wasn't in the know just agreed with the group. And that's scary when you think about it, isn't it? It's scary when you think about it because we live in a culture that is anti-God, that doesn't believe the creation account here. You take this and you kind of, you take the evolution aspect of, or the evolutionary theory, I want to emphasize that theory, 
you bring that theory into this line of thinking, and it's, it makes sense sometimes how some people will kind of wind up getting indoctrinated because the group believes something to be true that actually isn't. Now, this is not an anti-evolution sermon necessarily today, although you could definitely pull elements out that would say, well, evolution, macro-evolution, not true, okay? I firmly believe that, that, that creation took place literally, literally, as Genesis 1 said. Um, I believe it was a literal six-day creation, okay? I'm not trying to argue with you about that if you disagree. I'm just saying um, the Bible says this, and so we kind of have to stand on the Bible, amen? Okay, the God's Word is the authority. Um, but so often, even by Christians, this idea of evolution gets adopted because we're in the group, we're in the group. So uh, Psalm 11, verse 3 says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, what's more foundational than creation? Right? I mean, what's more foundational than creation? And it, it makes sense why the enemy would like to tear this down. So, so God created man. He created mankind to know and to love him and to be known and loved by him. Listen, it says here, it says that Adam was created in the image of God. Look at chapter 1, verse 26. Let's look at it together. Chapter 1, verse 26. Uh, we're going to look at, we'll look at the whole thing. Uh, it says, then God said, let us make man in our image. Now, that plural us is intentional. Jesus was at creation. Amen. Holy Spirit at creation. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay? Let us make man in our own image after our likeness. And then it says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock and over all the earth and everything that creeps on the earth. God made mankind to, to be known, to love by him. Adam was made in the image and the likeness of God. He was perfect. He was sinless. And there was no effects of sin on him. Listen, no sickness. Adam, pre-fall, never had a cough. Okay? We're, we live... Uh, in an area that allergies kind of kick our tails. How many of you, like, just allergies really affect you? You hear my voice maybe a little bit today? My allergies are, are kind of kicking my tail right now, right? Um, it really is allergies, okay? <clears throat> but no sickness, no, listen, no wrinkles. Adam never had to go to bed, go, hold on, I gotta get my wrinkle cream here, right? Let me get my Mary Kay, let me get my, under my eyes, let me get my corner of my mouth. He, he never had to do that, okay? Eve never had to do that. No graying, no balding in Jesus' name. No aching. Adam never woke up and was like, oh, my back. Right? That never happened pre-fall. And no death. But beyond that, Adam had full access to God. He had access to God. He had fellowship with God. I, I want you to see this. Let's just take a second. Uh, hold your place right here. We've looked a little bit at the beginning. We're going to look some more. Will you turn to me and just look at the end? with me. Will you look at the end? Revelation 21. We're going to look at a couple of verses in chapter 21 and a couple of verses in chapter 22. If we want to see a good picture of what it was like for Adam in the beginning, we, we can also see this in what God's going to make it like in the end, the new heaven and new earth. Revelation 21, let's start in verse 1. We'll read four or five verses, and we'll look at chapter 2 maybe for three or four verses. Here we go. Revelation 21. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. You see that? With God with us. Amen. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Now look at verse four. This is the good stuff. Well, this is more of the good stuff. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Jump to, verse, jump to chapter 22, look at verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Now, this is some specific stuff here, but we'll get to the general things in a minute. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. I can't, listen, we're going to get to eat in heaven, y'all. Okay? This is going to be good. Okay? 
Probably not bacon, though. <clears throat> the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, verse 3. No longer will there be anything accursed. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light. And they will reign forever. With him they will reign forever and ever. So you want to kind of get a picture of, of what a lot of it was like as far as the absence of some of the effects of sin. We can look at the end. It's going to be, like, it's going to be a lot like the beginning, pre-fall, okay? So God created man to know him and to love him and to be known and loved by him. And then God made Eve from, from Adam, okay? So one, God created mankind to know and to love him. Two, God placed mankind in a perfect perfect atmosphere. Look at chapter 1, verse 31. It was read over us earlier. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Look at chapter 2. Let's start in verse 4. Chapter 2, starting in verse 4. Let's read this together. Uh, let's see here. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. And the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man from dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first was the Pishon and it is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the, and the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. And the name of the second river is the Gihon. And it is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now listen, God puts man in this perfect atmosphere, perfect creation. Nothing dies. All, all the animals we see in chapter one are herbivores. No, everything's eating plants right? So there are no predators. There's no prey, no fear, no death, nothing like this. In the, in the original, the first six days of, cre of creation, the first five you say, and it, it was evening morning the first day, and he, saw, and he said it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. Well, we get to chapter 1, verse 31, and everything is made. We see chapter 1 and chapter 2 are not, they don't contradict one another. It's a Hebrew writing style where chapter 2 is coming in and giving some of the details about chapter 1. Okay, and so uh, and at the end of chapter one, though, in this culmination in this synopsis of creation, God says He doesn't say it's good. He says it's very good. It's complete, and God puts Adam and Eve in this perfect environment. See, some some of us grew up in a rough setting, didn't we? Actually, probably all of us grew up in a rough setting. Some was just more rough than others, right? We all grew up in a rough setting, and sometimes we think, well. You know, if my environment had been better, you see someone who does something despicable, right? And you think, okay, what environment did they grow up in? And how much did that contribute? Of course, it may have contributed some. Of course, Ephesians talks about that, right? Uh, of course, it contributed some. But listen, Adam and Eve are placed in a perfect environment. And we're going to see next week, they still choose to sin. They still choose to sin. So we can't fully... Blame it on this environment. I heard someone say one time, it's a, a famous uh, leader, uh, the church that I once served at, he was there and he shared this. And I kind of winced, I kind of cringed because I don't think this was true. He said, um, he said, you know, if you lead a faithful life as a parent, your kids will follow Jesus. And I thought, mm, mm, mm. Right? Because, listen, how many of us have, have seen really godly, faithful parents, 
and at least one of their kids wind up being rebellious, at least for a season, right? Okay, try not to look at them right now, okay? Okay? But you've also seen, I've also, as a youth pastor, listen, I saw some parents who I knew were horrible parents. I saw some kids who came out of abusive homes, they were rescued out of it, but for a large part of their childhood, they were abused. And some of those kids wound up being some of the most godly people I've ever met. Right? Because Ephesians 2 says, but God. <laughs> right? God intercedes. God, God steps in. But God placed man in a perfect atmosphere, and it still wasn't good enough. Now, we're getting ahead of ourselves, and I don't want to get into next, next week's sermon. All right? So third, God gave mankind purpose. God gave man purpose. Now, why do I say that? Look at the, we're going to look at a few passages here in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Genesis, so get ready here. Chapter 1, look at verse 26. We're going to look at the last half of verse 26. It says, And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Jump down to verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Best verse in the Bible. Okay? Be fruit. Y'all are allowed to laugh. It's okay, right? I mean, like, God wrote it. It's okay, okay? Be fruitful and multiply in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now look at chapter 2. Let's start in verse 15. Chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. He's to work and to keep. In the, listen, okay, sidebar here, sidebar. Ladies, single ladies, young single ladies specifically, okay? If he doesn't have a job, he's not ready to date you. Okay? Hey, guys, if you don't have a job, you're not ready to date. <laughs> ladies, ladies, listen, listen. Ladies, do you, young ladies, do you really want to date somebody who, in order to get money to take you out, has to go ask mommy for it? That's not a man, that's a boy. <laughs> right? You could work somewhere doing something to earn a little money to go for, go for a date. Right? I played two sports in high school, and I worked a part-time job. It's doable. Okay? I was decent. I was pretty good. Okay? So it wasn't like I, it's doable. Right? So sidebar over. All right, we're back. Adam had a job. Okay? And his job, in part, was to, to experience this. Now look at verse 19 and the first part of verse 20. Look at verse 19 the first part of verse 20. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. Okay, let's stop there. So Adam had a job. He had a purpose. He wasn't just like hanging out, eating apples the whole day. He was working the land. He was. Okay, he was working the land, it, and it was a lot easier to do that then. Imagine how good at this Adam would have been. Perfect, sinless man, so he knows what to do, and he's not tempted to be lazy. And he's in an environment that the environment still hasn't been cursed yet. Imagine how beautiful this would have been. Have you ever, one of the things we want to do, we haven't had the chance to go do it yet, but we want to go to Gibbs Gardens. Gibbs Garden, Gardens, I'm not sure, right? You know what I'm talking about. I want to go see that. I want to go see that in the spring. I want to go see that in the summer. I want to go see some of those things. It's, it's, I'm told it's beautiful. What would the Garden of Eden look like? Seriously, what would it have looked like? How beautiful would that have been? Wouldn't that have been amazing? This is Adam's job, okay? So we as believers, listen, we as believers should not be tree huggers, because that implies we're worshiping creation, not the creator. But we should really care about the land. It shouldn't be those who we disagree with, some of us politically, are the only ones who talk about taking care of things. 
right? As Christians, Adam, this was Adam's job. We should care about our land. That doesn't mean we should never do anything like to gain resources. We just shouldn't exploit it in the, in the most negative term. We should enjoy it. So, some of y'all, some of y'all this spring, if you're physically capable, you need to get outside and go on a hike and enjoy God's creation. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. Just don't fall, right, Daniel? No falling, right? In Jesus' name, amen. Deliana got an amen. She said yes on that one, right? We need to enjoy God's creation, but because creation has fallen now, again, next week, it's next week, but because it's fallen, some of the most beautiful places, if you're not careful, they'll kill you, right? You see some of the most, like you see pictures of this desert. You see pictures of this rainforest. It's like, wow. You see pictures of the ocean. It's like, holy cow, look at that. If you're not careful, they'll kill you, <laughs> right? But God creates man with this purpose to oversee this, to keep it and to work it. Number four, God gave mankind free will and a warning. He gave us free will and a warning. Look at chapter two, verses eight and nine. Chapter two, verses eight and nine. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now jump down to verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Listen, one rule. Right? One rule. I, um, one of the parenting hacks that, that my first pastor told us, he said, don't have a bunch of rules in your house for your kids. Have, some, have a few rules that are big and broad and like cover a couple of things. They'll remember it better, and you'll remember it better. <laughs> just have a couple, just a few big rules, not a ton of little rules. Okay? They had one rule. <laughs> Just one, don't eat off that tree. That's it. Just don't eat off of, like, oh, this is so restrictive. <laughs> you know, like, I can't deal with all this pressure of that one rule, right? You had one rule. It's almost like, you know, what's the, you had one job. You had one job, right? You had one rule. Just don't do that one thing. And the rest of it, like, it's, it's free to you. It's open to you. Some people look at God and they think, God, you're so restrictive. I can't believe all these restrictions you put on us. Ultimately, it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Big rules. They cover a lot, but there's, I mean, it's simple, right? It's simple, isn't it? Well, let, let's talk about this. He gives them free will and a warning. How do I get that? Okay, let's, let's just think about this. If there's no tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden, do Adam and Eve even have the option to sin? No. There would be no option, would there? Okay, well, Eric, and I used to think this. You say, Pastor Eric, why would God just, wouldn't it have been better if he just not put that tree there? <laughs> like, wouldn't that have been, just don't, don't give him an option. Don't just, wouldn't, that be, wouldn't, we, wouldn't we have to be dealing with less right now if that tree wasn't in the garden? Why did God put that stupid tree there? Right, and that's how broken and messed up we are, that we think God did something wrong. Right? Why did God put that tree there? Here's why God put that tree there. Because without the opportunity to love something else, true love can never exist. God didn't want to make you a robot. God had to give Adam and Eve another option. Otherwise, true love doesn't exist. One pastor that I listened to said it like this. Imagine you're on a date with somebody and this is the person you want to spend the rest of your life with them, but they haven't bought in yet. <laughs> okay, they haven't. Any, anybody been there? You were the first person who was like, okay, you're the one, and they're like, mm, I'm still thinking about it. I'm still praying about it, <laughs> right? Well, you met the one, and, and she's the one, or he's the one. And we'll say, we'll say from a guy's perspective, because that's who I am. It would it'd be weird for me to talk about a guy right now. All right, so, so she's the one, right? And someone comes to you, and they say, look, 
I've got this little green pill because apparently color of the pill matters in 2020. It's a different pill, right? It's this green pill. And if you put this little pill in their drink when they're not paying attention, it'll dissolve immediately. And when they drink this, if they see you, they'll immediately and forever fall in love with you, and that'll be it. And so you're, imagine you're out to dinner, and she kind of, oh, look over there. Look at those sweet kids. And she turns and looks and look, plop. <laughs> She turns back. She takes a sip of her Coke or whatever she's drinking. Sweet tea. Because <clears throat> if it's not sweet tea, she might not be the one. Anyway, um, <clears throat> okay. So, so takes a drink of her sweet tea and then looks at you. And it's just like immediately, like, do you want to get married now or, you know, wait five minutes? Right? And so you marry this girl and she's the one. And and every day, you, before you wake up, she's got you breakfast in bed because she loves you so much. I mean, like everything is, everything you would ever want in marriage, she's just wonderful at this and she's wonderful at that. And she just always is caring for you, always taking care of you. And for like the first three or six months, it's like you're like, this is heaven on earth. This is awesome. But you're smart, aren't you? Well, some of us. And after a while, you are intelligent enough to go, okay, hold on. Does she really love me? Or is this just the pill? Right? Because if there's no, if she doesn't have an option to love anything or anyone else, is it, is it actual real love? Right? So God puts this, this option, this, 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 this way for Adam and Eve, and every time they walk past that tree, every time they eat something else, every time they walk past it and don't partake of it, Essentially, what they're saying is, God, I love you, I trust you, and I'm going to follow you. Every single time. We'll get into next week how that goes wrong. Okay? But every single time they pass by it and choose something else, they're choosing God over, over this. They're choosing God over this. So God gave them free will, but he also gave them a warning. He says, if you eat of it, you'll die. Sin leads to death. It's a one-to-one. Sin leads to death. Our sin nature is passed down to us. Again, next week, sin leads to death. If there were no sin, Adam and Eve would have lived forever, literally on the earth. And if we hadn't partaken, we wouldn't be here right now. We would be there right now. But here we are. So he, gave, he gives them free will and he gives them a warning in this perfect creation. Number five, we're almost done. God created mankind with a need and desire for community. With a need and desire for community. Look at Genesis 2, verses 18, and then we'll jump down to verse 20. All right, look at verse 18 and we'll jump down to verse 20. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, a couple things. Number one, this is the only thing about creation God says isn't good. And the word helper is not demeaning, okay? Like, you're just the little helper, ladies. That's not what it's talking about. That is not what it's talking about. Okay, this is more in line with Jesus calling Holy Spirit, your help, the helper will come. You get that? And some of us, maybe you think, well, sometimes she thinks she's Holy Spirit, okay? No, she doesn't. Don't, don't be mean to her like that, okay? But helper, there's, there wasn't a helper fit for him. Look, look at uh, verse 20 through 25. Now, look at this. The man gave names to all the livestock and all the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. In other words, these an- he's seeing these animals, male, female, male, female, male, female. And he's seeing this and he's like, I want one. <laughs> right? I-, I want one. Everybody, that, why do they get one and I don't get one? Right? And, and so look at verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. Let's talk about this for a second. I, I don't know if there was or not. Do you think maybe there was a scar there? I'm not sure. My dad always asked me. My dad, if you heard, he was a character. He still is a character. He may be more of one in heaven. It's just not fallen anymore. Okay? He was a character. He would ask me all the time, Eric, I have this theological question. And I knew what was coming. Was, Did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? Like deep theological question. Did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? And I remember the first time he asked me that. It was like, I don't know. Like, it's a really good question. Like they, you know, like maybe, I don't know, all right? Uh, 
That would look weird, but whatever. Let's keep going. I get derailed. Verse 22. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last. No wonder he said it last. Okay? I'm thinking like the song. At last. Right? At last. At last, bone, this is at last bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. In other words, she's like me, finally. She's like, I have one like me. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Just like a husband immediately talking about sex. <clears throat> Verse 25. Yes, I said that at church, and yes, it is okay. Verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Again, uh, yes, I said that at church, and yes, it is okay. So what am I, what are we, t- yeah, amen, right? <laughs> what are we talking about here? Think of a, a few things. Adam has this desire for relationship. He's like, there's not one like me, verse 20. Like, there wasn't one fit for him. There's no one for me. He had this desire. God gave him that. And God uh, takes the rib from Adam. Have you ever thought about, like, why a rib? Have you ever thought about why a rib? I heard someone explain it one time, and I, I use this in the weddings that I do. Um, he didn't take something from Adam's foot, symbolizing the, yeah, you're on top of her. He didn't take something from Adam's head, saying, yep, she's going to be over you. The idea of the rib, like, we're in this together, close to his heart, intended that he would help protect her, but that she would be with him side by side, not behind, side by side together. Side by side. I love that symbolism. And we see in verse 25 this picture of true intimacy. Listen, they were naked and were not ashamed. Now listen, they were physically naked, okay? Okay, and all the married people said, Amen. Okay? They were physically naked, but they were more than that. It's, it's this idea, listen, they weren't hiding anything from one another. No insecurities. No fears. No past regrets. Fully open and fully known to the other person in every way. That, that verse, that's biblical intimacy. That's biblical intimacy. No hiding, no shame, no heartache, no pride, no selfishness. Great communication, right? Listen, guys, Adam gave more than one word answers. How was your day? Good. You, how do you feel? Uh, hungry. Like, like, you know what I mean? Like, he gave more than one word answers. He was, he was, present with her, and she was present with him. And then last, and this is the best part, God was with mankind. Now, we're going to get in chapter 3. We're going to look at half of a verse, but here's the end. Ready? Look at chapter 3. Look at the first part of verse number 8. Now, in in the narrative here, Adam and Eve have sinned, but there's something about this verse that applies actually to the previous chapter as well. Look at chapter 3, verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Stop. There's no biblical reason for us not to strongly assume that this was God's pattern. The cool breeze of the evening God with his people, literally with his people. God's heart, I want you to hear this. God's heart is that he wants to be with you and he wants you with him. This is how it was in the beginning. And because there was no sin, he could actually come into man's presence because there was no sin that he would have to stay away, that he would have to keep man at a distance. God's heart from the beginning And we have seen that God's heart in the end is to be with us, that he will be, the scripture says he'll be their God and they will be his people. We're going to be with him forever. 
if we know Jesus. Today, my question to you is this. My question to you is, do you know the Lord? God desires this relationship with you. He loves you. He loves you so much that he literally gave his son so that he could be with you and so that you could be with him. So today, if you don't know the Lord, here's my question. Why in the world would you turn away a God who loves you like this? Why in the world would you say no? It makes no sense to me. If you do know the Lord today, my question to you is this. How's your fellowship? Is there sin you need to confess? Is there a pattern of life that you know has not been honoring the Lord and, and you, you like it, so you're holding on to it, but you're miserable? You don't have to be miserable. Don't believe the lie that that's better than God. Let's pray together.